Hello, I am Juan Cabrera, and I work with the University of Missouri Extension as a field specialist in horticulture. Today, I'm going to talk about correcting pH and salinity issues in soils. The only way to know if the conditions in the soil are adequate for your crop is through a soil test. Here's an example of a soil test result. For today's purpose, we're going to focus on the soil pH and the electrical conductivity. This is an optional parameter that you can test in case you suspect any issues with your crop. Let's begin talking about soil pH. Soil pH is represented by a scale that goes from 1 to 14, in which a pH of 7 is said to be neutral. Any values below 7 are considered acidic, and any values above 7 are considered basic or alkaline. So why is pH important? pH is important because the pH of the soil will affect the availability of nutrients for plant roots. Let's look at the diagram on the right side of this slide. The thickness of each bar represents how much of that nutrient is available for root uptake. The thicker the bar, the more available is that specific element. Assume that we have these elements in the right amount that the plants need. So we're talking about availability. If we have, for example, a pH that's very acidic, let's say between 4 and 5, notice that at this pH, some elements will not be available for uptake. For example, let's look at potassium. Notice that the bar is very thin, and these can lead to deficiencies. Plants will not have enough potassium, and crop yields will be affected. On the other hand, look at, let's look at iron. Look at the width of the bar. Notice that iron is highly available at this pH, and that some plants may develop toxicity, also affecting crop yield. So this pH range is not adequate for most crops. So, what is the adequate soil pH? In general, most plants prefer a soil pH between 6 to 7. Beware that some plants may want a pH that's beyond this recommended range. For example, blueberries like it when the soil pH is between 4.5 and 5. So, you tested the soil, you figure out what's your pH, and you notice that your pH is out of range. So what do you do to adjust the pH of the soil? So we have several options. So let's look at the, the different options that you can use to decrease the pH. In other words, when the pH is too high and you want to make it more acidic to lower the pH, you can use elemental sulfur, sulfate type fertilizers, fertilizers in which most of the total nitrogen is provided by urea or ammonium, Look at the label for the potential acidity of this fertilizer. You can also use organic amendments such as incorporation of peat moss and plant residue. On the other hand, when the pH is too low and you want to increase the pH or make more basic or alkaline, you can use limestone. And there are several options for limestone. You have calcitic limestone, which provides calcium as a nutrient but you also have dolomitic limestone that provides calcium and magnesium as nutrients also. Consider that the purity of the material and the particle size or grade will affect how effective this material is at changing the pH. We also have potassium bicarbonate that you can use, and the advantage of this is that this is water soluble and you can inject this in water. Flowable lime, hydrated or burned limestone, now, notice that I have some marks there next, next to those. Those are highly reactive materials that can burn or decimate your crop. You want to use these with caution and make sure that when you're using them, there's no plant or you use them before you plant your crop. And you can use fertilizers that the total nit nitrogen is mostly nitrate-based. Check the label for potential basicity. And lastly, but not least, also think about your water source. If you have water with high alkalinity, or water that's considered hard, over time, this water is gonna increase the pH of your soil if you do not neutralize that excessive alkalinity in the water. Now, I mentioned that fertilizers will affect the soil pH. Keep in mind that the components in the fertilizer will react with the soil, and microbes in the soil will use these components for the metabolism, and as a byproduct, the pH of the soil will change. Here we have a table with several fertilizers, and notice that in the second column, we have a fertilizer reaction. We have a letter and a number. The first letter refers to whether this fertilizer is going to have an acidic or a basic reaction on the soil. The second number refers to the equivalent amount of calcium carbonate in this fertilizer 
per ton of fertilizer. And in the third column, we have how much of the total nitrogen in the fertilizer comes from ammonium and urea. And remember that ammonium and urea in the fertilizers tend to have an acidifying effect in the soil. And notice that in this list, we have a cutoff value. So if you're using any fertilizer that has over 25% of the total nitrogen coming from ammonium and urea, this fertilizer will have an acidifying reaction on the soil. On the other hand, if you have a fertilizer in which less than 25% of the total nitrogen comes from ammonium and urea, this fertilizer will have a basic effect on the soil. It is important that you check the label and most fertilizer will tell you what percentage of the total nitrogen comes from ammonium, urea, or nitrate. Here's an example of a sample label. You have the first three numbers, which refers to the percentage of nitrogen, phosphate, and potash. We have how much is total nitrogen, and the label for this specific product doesn't specify which percentage of the total nitrogen comes from ammonium, nitrate, or urea. However, it does tell you what is the potential effect of this fertilizer on the soil. Notice here that it says that it has a potential acidity equivalent of 250 pounds of calcium carbonate per ton of fertilizer, meaning that this fertilizer will acidify the soil. So let's move on to some examples on how to lower the soil pH. And everything begins with a soil sample. You have to know what is your initial pH and what is your target pH. These tables show the amount of elemental sulfur you need to change the pH from the actual level in the soil to a target pH. And notice that the amounts you'll need depends on the texture of the soil. On the left side of this slide, we have the amounts of sulfur you need to reach a target pH of 6.5 and 5.5. On the right side, we have the amount of elemental sulfur you need to reach a pH of 4.5, which is adequate for blueberries. The soil test result that we get from the soil testing lab over at the University of Missouri will give you a recommendation of how much sulfur to add to change the pH. Now, what do you do to increase the soil pH? What happens when the soil pH is too high? Notice here that for this specific example, the pH is 4.7, which is very low for crops in general. Now, if your soil test result is for your home garden, this will give you a recommendation of how many pounds of limestone you need to add per 1,000 square feet of garden. But this is a soil test result for a commercial grower. Notice that the limestone suggestion is given as effective neutralizing material. It's not telling you how many pounds of limestone you need per acre. And you may be wondering, what is ENM? ENM is a value that refers to how efficient is a limey material at changing the pH of the soil. And the effectiveness of a limey material will depend on the purity of the material and how finely ground is the material or the grade. Here we have a table that shows the purity of different limey materials compared to calcium carbonate, which is a standard reference for lining materials. Notice that shale meal, which is the first option here, is a 95% equivalent to calcium carbonate. Why? Because shale meal will have other components to it, so it's not 100% calcium carbonate. Notice also that we can have liming materials with over 100%. That means that their neutralizing capacity is higher than that of calcium carbonate. Grade or fineness refer to how finely ground are those particles in that liming material. Here we have a graph that's showing how quickly a liming material would change the pH based on or how fine are the particles of the liming material. The higher the mesh, the smaller the particle size. Notice that when the particle size is small, it takes less time for the liming material to change the pH. These, both these numbers are considered when determining the ENM of a liming material. Now, how do we use ENM, this value, to determine how much limey material we need to change the pH of a soil? Remember that the effective, effective neutralizing material, ENM, expresses the amount of limestone you need to get a change in soil pH. And you can calculate how many tons of, lime, of that limey material you need per acre by using the simple equation you only need to divide the ENM that's in the soil test by the ENM of the limey material. Let's look at an example. Let's say that your soil test 
calls for 2050 ENM as a liming suggestion. And you go to your limestone dealer and they have a liming material that's rated for 400 ENM. So how many tons of that liming material will need per acre? You need to divide the 2050 from your soil test by the 400 from your liming material. And in this specific example, we need 5.1 tons of that limey material per acre. And remember, the only way to know this is to get your soil tested. Before adjusting the pH of the soil, consider the timing, both in terms of when do you test your soil and when do you apply the lime. Ideally, you should test your soil in the fall so you have time to purchase and apply limestone and give it enough time to react and adjust the pH before planting your crop the following year. It takes on average three to six months for the limestone to react, so plan accordingly. In terms of the amounts, try not to apply more than three tons of limestone per acre per application. If you need more, wait between six months and a year before applying the rest. Try to incorporate the limestone to a depth of four to eight inches, which is about the same depth that people tend to plow their fields. Now let's move on with high salinity. High salinity affects both the crop and the physical structure of the soil. In plants, high salinity will affect crop performance, and you'll notice that the plants will show drought-like symptoms even after watering, toxicity symptoms such as the one shown in the picture in the top right corner, we notice that the edges of the leaves have a burnt appearance and nutrient disorders in the plants. High salinity in soils may result in loss of soil structure. Here we have soil particles being held together by calcium. The calcium ion is considered as an ion that aggregates soil particles. Why? Because calcium has a positive two charge. And remember that soil particles in general have negative charges. So calcium acts as a bridge that holds together soil particles, giving the soil that structure it needs. On the other hand, sodium only has a positive, one positive charge. That means that sodium is going to disperse particles instead of acting as a bridge to bring them together. So that soil will lose its structure. Therefore, it becomes more susceptible to crusting, erosion, and poor water movement, such as infiltration and drainage. Typical sources of high salinity our irrigation water. That's why it's important to get your water tested. Improper use of fertilizer, seepage zones, and soils with poor drainage and infiltration. We measure electrical conductivity as an indicator of salt concentration. And in the picture of the right, you see that with higher electrical conductivity, the crop performance decreases. So how do you manage high salinity? First, you need to know what are the tolerance levels for your crop. And you can use that link in the screen to see what are the tolerance levels for each crop. Then you need to get a soil and water test to determine if you need to address salinity issues. If you need to correct salinity issues, use these steps. First, you need to mechanize the soil to improve drainage and infiltration and if you have high sodium content, you may want to consider adding calcium so that you can displace the sodium from the soil. Then apply 10 to 12 inches of high quality water. And with high quality water, I mean water with low electrical conductivity. Repeat these steps until you have reached the desired levels. After this, think about practices you can use to reduce water evaporation from soils, such as mulching. In high tunnels, it is common for soils to develop nutrient imbalances and high salinity. You can leave the high tunnel open during the winter and early spring and let the snow and the rainfall wash off the salt accumulation. If you have additional questions, you can reach us anytime.